Good evening, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Arjun Dhar, and with Julia, we are Speaker Secretaries at the Cambridge University Law Society. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank our Speakers Program sponsor, Clifford Chance. Clifford Chance is a world-class law firm which values its relationship <laughs> with the Cambridge University Law Society to secure some of the best and brightest future lawyers for the firm. Clifford Chance have opportunities for students from first year onwards. You can find out more by visiting their website. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Allen. Good evening. My job is to introduce our two uh, eminent speakers this evening who are going to give us their views about the constitutional foundations of judicial review. Uh, they hardly need any introduction from me, but uh, as you know, Professor Paul Craig is Professor of Law at Oxford, uh, the, a very eminent authority on administrative law, not only in the UK, but as his recent Hamlin lectures show, uh, he's an expert on UK, EU, and indeed global administrative law. Professor Christopher Forsyth was recently the Sir David Williams Professor of Public Law here at Cambridge, and he is, of course, the, the current author of Wade and Forsyth on administrative law. So I'm going to ask each of them to talk for just 15 minutes, which will be uh, quite a task, and in that 15 minutes, they'll summarise uh, their understanding of the correct way to conceive of the foundations of judicial review. Uh, and uh, I don't know who wants to begin. We haven't settled that. I, uh, thought, we, I thought Chris was beginning. Okay, so, so, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Forsyth will begin. <clears throat> I see the notes that I made from my Roman law lecture in this room earlier today, <laughs> which I see there are many attendees, first-year students who came to my Roman law lecture and have now come to this lecture, so you're probably going to have more than enough of me. I, of course, may get confused and start to lecture in a spot of Roman law to keep us going. I was never that keen on ultravirus. <laughs> but I was driven to it and I was driven to it by what I've termed pragmatic reasons and also profound constitutional reasons and the pragmatic reason really arises from the fact that I first learned administrative law a long way away from Cambridge in South Africa. And so I kept an eye on South African administrative law and knew there was a case called State President against the UDF. Before we go into this case, I'll just say in South Africa there was a sovereign parliament, no protection of human rights. This is before the political transformation. Sovereign parliament, no protection of fundamental rights. And a state of emergency was declared by the state president in terms of his powers under the Public Safety Act of 1953. And claimants wanted to challenge some of the emergency decrees. And the pre chief ground of challenge was that the emergency decrees were too unclear, too uncertain to be able to act as a guide to conduct. The trouble was there was an Aster Clause the Aster Clause said no decree made in terms of this act shall be called in question in any court of law. So the challenge to the decree is made. 
and at first instance and on the first appeal. The Aster Clause argument loses on classic administrative law reasoning. It said the requirement that the that the emergency decree should be clear is implied from the statute. It's something that Parliament's taken to have in mind in enacting the Public Safety Act and the Ulster Clause that they're in. And therefore, the unclear statute, sorry, the unclear decree is made outside the powers of the State President under the Act. And so it's not made in terms of this Act. And so it's not caught by the Aster Clause. It's classic reasoning based upon the English case of Annas Minnick that you should be familiar with, become familiar with, if you're not familiar with now. When it got to the, to, to the court that is now the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa, it was called the Appellate Division in those days. Their cunning lawyers had picked up that there was criticism being made in England of the ultra-virus doctrine. And so the argument was put to the Supreme Court of Appeal that indeed the decrees had to be clear but that requirement came from the common law not from the ultra-virus doctrine and consequently and consequently it was they were made in terms of the act they were intravirus, they were made in terms of the Act, and so they were not caught by the Aster Clause. Sorry, they were caught by the Aster Clause. <clears throat> Professor Craig's criticism of the ultravirus doctrine was specifically referred to by the court and adopted. Professor Wade's defence of the ultra-virus doctrine was considered and rejected by the court. And so they came to the conclusion that the emergency decree fell within the terms of the Aster Clause. The unclear decrees were made in terms of this Act and so the Aster Clause prevented judicial review. That argument effectively made Aster Clauses work, and judicial review in South Africa was completely eviscerated until the political transformation that you'll all be aware of. And I thought, this is something that makes me think that you shouldn't throw out the ultra-virus doctrine for fear of getting thrown out the baby with the bathwater. And that's my pragmatic reason why I found myself being driven into the ultra-virus camp. I saw the dangers and... I knew what could happen. The evisceration of judicial review was the result of Annas Minnick being overturned. That's my first pragmatic reason. But my principled reason then flowed from the fact that we have a sovereign parliament. I don't want to be too dogmatic about that in the presence of 
such an eminent criticism, critic of the sovereignty of Parliament as Professor Allen. But there's no escape in it. <laughs> Every single judge who heard the Miller case, first instance and on appeal before the Supreme Court, Every single judge who heard the Miller case approved of Dicey's classic formulation that with us, parliamentary sovereignty means that Parliament can make or unmake any law at all. It's not a question of whether you like parliamentary sovereignty or whether you don't. You cannot wish it away. And given that we've got a sovereign parliament, how does this fit in with first in the foundations of judicial review in the common law? Suppose a decision maker complies with every requirement laid down by Parliament, expressly or impliedly, for the validity of his decision. Decision-maker complies expressly or, or, or complies with every requirement for validity, express or implied. If the common law comes along and says there's an extra requirement, legal representation in this hearing is not required. That's what the common law says in these circumstances. Or perhaps the common law wants to change one of the requirements for validity. There doesn't have to be an oral hearing, for example. Or perhaps the, the legislator having said that there doesn't need to be an oral hearing in these circumstances, the common law wants to make the hearing oral. Presuppose compliance with every requirement laid down expressly or impliedly by the statute. If the common law comes up and says there is an extra requirement to be added in. It is challenging Parliament's power to specify what the requirements for validity are. And so it is challenging the supremacy of Parliament. So if you criticise the, the ultra-virus doctrine and want it to be abandoned, you must face up to the task that you have to criticise the sovereign parliament as well. And I'm pleased to say Professor Allen agrees with me on that basis. At least in his 2002 Cambridge Law Journal article, he says this, despite their protestations to the contrary, the common law theorists cannot reasonably object to ultra vires in its very modest, modified version while continuing to accept absolute parliamentary supremacy. In this sense, Christopher Forsyth is right to maintain that weak critics of our parliaments, <laughs> those that do not explicitly challenge the sovereignty of parliament, are, whether they intend it or not, transmuted into strong critics who do challenge the supremacy of parliament. Insofar as the common law basis for judicial review is offered as a viable and genuine alternative to legislative intent broadly understood, it entails at least a limited qualification of legislative power. I agree with every word of that. <laughs>
So you are driven to it. Abandoned ultravares. You have to abandon the sovereignty of Parliament too. And that's what I'd like the late motif to be of this debate, although it seldom turns out that way. How do you reconcile the creativity, the creativity of the judiciary in developing the principles of and details and nuance of ultra, of of the of the principles of good administration. How do you reconcile the creativity of the judiciary in developing the principles of good administration with the supremacy of Parliament? My answer is straightforward. The modified ultravirus doctrine. You say, as is perfectly reasonable and plausible, that when Parliament allocates a power to make a particular decision, Parliament intends that that decision-making power should be exercised in a way that is fair and reasonable. And the, and the judges then, when they say whether it is fair and reasonable on, on a judicial review or whatever, are doing what Parliament intended. You've reconciled the supremacy of Parliament with the creativity of the judges. There is an inevitable tension in our constitutional order between the supremacy of Parliament and the creativity of the judges. It seems to me that the modified ultra-virus doctrine is the best reconciliation of that issue so far declared. I'll end with one final point. I would claim one thing for my original article, the Fig Leaves and Fairy Tale article that kicked off this debate. I would claim one thing for it. Before the Fig Leaves article, there was a buffet <coughs> approach to the ultra-virus doctrine or the basis of judicial review. If you like the ultra-virus doctrine, you could take it from the buffet. If you didn't, you left it there and you took the common law instead and you took something else that you might like. Without regard to the constitutional consequences and the pragmatic consequences of abandonment. And with my Fig Leaves article, put those two issues on the, on, on, on the table and I think that that was a good thing for it to do. And that's, I'm done until questions. Well, I'll ask Professor Craig to <clears throat> reply. Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. There's a slight sense of deja vu all over again because Chris and I did this a few years ago. I can't remember quite how many, but probably before your generation of students. You won't be surprised to know that I don't agree with much of that. Um, uh, but I'm going to take us through a little slideshow at rattling speed because I've only got a limited amount of time to try and explain why although I respect the argument, I don't believe it's correct, either pragmatically or in normative terms. So the foundations. Um, we have a core claim that the precepts of review must be based on legislative intent, since if this were not so, such review would constitute a strong challenge to the sovereignty of Parliament. That's the point that Chris has just reiter uh, reiterated. And that's supported, that's the cornerstone of the ultra-virus school. The advocates of the common law school reject it. They accept that if such intent exists, it will indeed be taken into account by the courts in precisely the same manner as in any other area where such intent may exist. They reject the claim that such intent must exist in order 
prevent a strong challenge to sovereignty. So again, rattling through some of this stuff, which is fairly well known, of course, two different senses of intent, legislative intent, specific and general, specific intent, Parliament has intent as the meaning of how each particular head of review should apply in each statute, and in that said, in that sense, if they did have it, could validly be said to be author or part author of the resulting doctrine. The model of general legislative intent, by way of contrast, is predicated on the following idea. Parliament is taken, and again, Chris iterated this in his own talk a moment ago, Parliament is taken to intend that its legislation conforms to the basic principles of fairness and justice which operate in a constitutional democracy. However, because Parliament itself cannot realistically work out the precise ramifications of that general idea, it leaves or delegates power to the courts to work out how the precepts of JR, uh, to work out the precepts of JR in accord with the rule of law. Now, again, as we heard at the tail end of Christopher's speech, um, the UV school is based primarily now on general legislative intent, GLI, not specific legislative intent, SLI, and it's also known as the modified ultra-virus doctrine. The general reason why most people have dumped the SLI model is that the empirical foundation for it is completely lacking. Parliament does not invince a specific legislative intent in relation to each and all the different facets of JR concerning each and every piece of legislation. It is a chimera and a fiction. Okay, just moving on very quickly, just to clear the ground before we get into the really serious stuff. Um, there aren't particular doctrinal consequences which flow from adherence to the two models. There are not. And I'm not claiming there are. There are constitutional implications, but there aren't necessarily doctrinal implications. But the real reason why there are no doctrinal implications is actually the second reason, which I can jump to for exigencies of time. The modified ultraviolet doctrine is a completely empty vessel. Actually, if I'm being more provocative, it's really actually a modified common law doctrine. That's what it's really about. It's really a modified common law doctrine. The real reason why, the real reason why there's not a difference between the common law model in terms of the... Seriously, the real reason why there's not a, a difference between the modified ultra-virus doctrine in terms of ultra-virus theory and the common law doctrine in terms of doctrinal consequences is, by, is that, by its own statement, the modified ultra-virus model is an empty vessel. It is simply a renvoi back to the common law to justify whatever the common law puts into the model at any point of time. It has no independent, self-standing content of its own. OK, now to the business end of business, the really important end of business. There's got to be a rationale for this claim. There's got to be a foundation for the claim that adherence to the common law model entails a strong challenge to the sovereignty of Parliament. And um, there are three arguments which can be discerned, and I, they are what I've termed an analytical argument, an empirical argument, and a theoretical or normative argument. Each of them is important and I will look at each of them in turn. Now, the analytical argument is the one that Christopher iterated in his important Cambridge Law Journal article, and he repeated it a moment ago. And the analytical argument is the one that we have in front of us on this slide now. And the, it's, a, it's a key argument, and it basically goes as I have set it out here. What an all-powerful parliament did not prohibit, it must be taken to authorise expressly or impliedly. Therefore, all elements of JR must be cloaked with legislative intent. If that were not so, the assumption would be that parliament did not intend 
the constraints on statutory power to exist, and therefore judicial imposition of such limits would amount to a strong challenge to parliamentary sovereignty. That, I think, is a faithful explication of Christopher's argument. There are three central difficulties with this argument, any one of which will knock it out, but there are three. Um, first, and actually really quite dramatically, was people just, and this is, seems to me really quite an important point, and people aren't locking on to it, and with respect, Christopher just glided over it in what he said. The argument only gets off the ground on a model of specific legislative intent. It makes, with respect, no sense in a model of general legislative intent to try and pose the question that you have on this slide in the context of a model of general legislative intent is simply not a meaningful question. It may be meaningful to ask in relation to a particular head of review. It might be meaningful to ask in relation to a particular head of review. Did in this statute Parliament intend um, the courts to substitute judgment on all questions of law? All right? Then you run through this analytical argument on this slide. Or did Parliament intend, in relation to another statute, for rationality review to be high intensity or low intensity? And then you run through this argument. It might be possible in relation to a third kind of statute to say, did Parliament really intend for there to be legal representation by barristers? And then you run through this argument again. The argument only makes sense if you're running a theory of legislative intent, which is specific legislative intent, you cannot ask this question on a model of general legislative intent or the modified ultra-virus doctrine. You just try and formulate that question in the context of the MUV model, formulate it, try and formulate it in a way which makes sense in the light of that analytical reasoning. You can't do it because the analytical reasoning itself is geared to the specific legislative intent model. So you can't buy both. The second reason is that the analytical argument is predicated on the assumption that Parliament must have an intent about something one way or another. And that's simply not true. There's a lot of theoretical literature which tells us, and I don't have a chance to go into this theoretical literature, but there's very good legal and philosophical literature which says that there's lots of things that people don't have an, an intent about one way or another. Now, if you think, oh, well, how does that play out? Why is that relevant in this context? Take the following example. Take a classic issue that we debate in administrative law doctrine the whole time, which is the test for review for error of law. Okay? We all know there's going to be some review for error of law, but what is the precise test going to be? Now, we have a range of possible tests which are set out on the second indent of this slide. And I think there are seven or eight possibilities. They quickly to run through them. You could have, say, court should substitute judgment on all errors of law, Court should be able to substitute judgment on jurisdictional errors of law. They should substitute judgment on some issues and exercise rationality review on others. They should show greater deference to legal determinations made by tribunals, but not by others. The intensity of review should be based on functional considerations or that there should be no distinction between review for law and fact. Now... The reality is that the legislature is likely to have absolutely no intent one way or another on those respective options. And the choice between them is the real doctrinal issue faced by courts in this country and in every other country. Why is this important for the consequence which is etched out on the third, on the third indent? It cannot be contended 
that legislative intent is necessary to prevent a strong challenge to parliamentary sovereignty, since that argument is premised on the assumption that Parliament has a, def a definite or definitive intent on the particular doctrinal issue one way or another. If it does not, and I repeat, I think you're living in fairy tale land if you think it does in relation to those previous eight options. If it does not, then the courts can choose between any of those available options without fear of infringing sovereignty. And that's the second difficulty. Third difficulty. It's really important when we're lawyers to think outside the box and to think of the consequences of adopting a particular line of reasoning and see what its implications are more broadly. And this is something that, with respect, um, the Ultravarez school has never uh, woken up to. And this is the problem. If the answer is, if they're correct, then it has the following consequence. That legislative intent must equally be regarded as the foundation for all bodies of law, including contract, tort, trust, property, restitution and the like, where the common law principles are read into legislation. Okay? Then you just have to go out and convince all the private lawyers that they've been thinking about the wrong thing, that private law is not really based on autonomy, dignity, equality, or whatever else they want to, uh, that they argue about all day long, but it's really based on legislative intent. Why? Why is this so? For the reason set out in that third indent. Legislation every day of the week, private law legislation every day of the week, is read subject to common law principles of contract or tort. Sale of goods legislation is read subject to common law principles of contract. Occupiers liability legislation is read subject to tort principles. Straight private law stuff all the time. Okay. If the analytical argument is correct, then we must equally cloak the application of such common law principles to statutes with legislative intent in all areas of the law. So with respect, I don't buy the analytical argument and I do not accept that we have to buy into it in order to prevent a strong challenge to sovereignty. So actually, yeah, we then move on quickly, because of my limits of time, there's an empirical argument. And the empirical argument, in effect, goes like this. While the SLI model, the specific legislative intent model, it was subject to the critique that it was empirically unrealistic, fairy tale land to assume that Parliament had a specific legislative intent as to the application of JR in a particular statute. General legislative intent, and again, Christopher put this eloquently a moment ago, is said to be justified because it is empirically realistic that Parliament could be regarded as having a general intent that administration should be subject to the general precepts of substantive and procedural legality. OK, so there's two difficulties with this. Um, and again, uh, I've got limits of time, so just to run through this very quickly. The empirical argument, firstly, elides approval and creation. A general legislative intent could doubtless be posited for all manner of things, including an end to child poverty, international conflict, economic recession, and perhaps a no-deal Brexit. Um, uh, but it could equally be posited for liberty, equality, and human happiness. That does not mean that anything done by Parliament necessarily had a causative impact on ending any of those things, nor, more importantly, does it mean that its general approval was a necessary condition for the existence of liberty, equality, and human happiness. So empirical proof of general legislative intent provides no evidence that the legislature had any role in the creation of the principles of JR or that its approval was necessary for that creation. The second difficulty, 
mirrors the difficulty, the third difficulty with the analytical argument. The argument proves too much. It proves too much for the following reason. If approval in this sense suffices for general legislative intent to be regarded as the foundation for JR, even if it no, played no part in its doctrinal creation, the same must equally be true for all areas of the law. So we get all 630 members of the House of Commons, we get them out into the fresh air, we say, stop talking about Brexit for the moment, come on to the Commons in front of Parliament, tell us, tell us now, you really do accept that the administration should comply with the general precepts of the rule of law, etc. And they'll say, yeah, 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 we think they should all be just and fair and all that. And then they're all getting a bit cold because it's a bit cold out there, and they're all about to go in, and you think, great. And then you, put, then you call them out again, and you say, um, well, do you think also that, um, uh, that the individuals in society should be subject to just principles of contract and tort and restitution, uh, and that equally you don't have time to make them so you delegate that power to the courts? And they say, yes, of course we do. Of course we do. The point I'm making here when I say the argument proves too much is that the empirical argument, this idea that Parliament would necessarily intend the precepts of good administration developed by the courts to be applicable, you can make that argument equally in relation to what the common law courts do in relation to tort, contract, trust, and any other body of law. There is nothing distinctive about public law in that sense okay final final part and then I'm done okay it is implicit in fact it's not implicit it's explicit in the ultra-virus narrative that their view is necessary in relation in order to prevent a strong challenge to sovereignty now, we've seen that the analytical argument, I don't believe the analytical argument works for the reasons I said earlier. But I also believe that the ultra-virus model is based upon a conception of parliamentary sovereignty, which is a possible conception, but it just doesn't happen to be our conception of sovereignty. You've got to distinguish between three different conceptions of sovereignty. The classic continuing model of sovereignty is the one that we have. Okay? It embodies the idea of legislative omnipotence in the sense of ability to change. Ability to change. Parliament has the last word, and every parliament has the last word. Okay? No substantive limits on parliament's power. It can, in theory, legislate on any subject matter. No procedural limits. No 51% majorities or two-thirds majorities or anything. Now, note here the third part of this slide. The consequence of this is that judicially created controls apply unless Parliament has indicated otherwise in pursuance of its continuing sovereignty. That's the implication and that's the model of JR with respect that we have worked with for 400 years. That's exactly what the common law courts were doing in the 15th century onwards. And that's how Parliament viewed the courts. The judicially created controls applied, and if Parliament, in pursuit of its undoubted sovereignty, if it wished to indicate the contrary, then it could say so and overrule or whatever what the courts were doing. Now, the reality is that actually the whole argument from the ultra-virus model is based upon a different model of sovereignty, what I call statutory monopoly. And it doesn't constitute the model of sovereignty that we've had in the UK ever since the term sovereignty was worth coining. The statutory monopoly model demands... In addition, in addition to what's in the first model, it demands that an integral aspect of sovereignty 
is that any legal norm that impacts on legislation can only be legitimate if it has the approval of the legislature through some showing of legislative intent. So it demands that Parliament give prior approval to any limit or term read into legislation as a condition of constitutional legitimacy. The consequence here is that judicial power is contingent on finding such consent. It does not suffice on this model that Parliament can change, reject or modify any conditions imposed by courts. I don't have time to go through the parliamentary monopoly model. It's even more far-reaching. Now, the ultra-virus model is predicated on the assumption that sovereignty means the statutory monopoly model. And the crucial difference between that and the classic continuing sovereignty model is this. Being all-powerful in the sense of the continuing sovereignty model does not logically entail the conclusion that all constraints on legislation must necessarily be authorised by Parliament ex ante in order to be constitutionally legitimate. In the UK, the constitutional reality, as judged by history, case law and principle, is adherence to the first continuing sovereignty model, not the second. And um, uh, for that reason... There is nothing at all odd, unusual, or normatively dangerous, let alone normatively revolutionary, in the courts through the common law, based upon the rule of law, developing and creating the tools of judicial review, with Parliament having the last word, as it always does. And of course, let me make this clear, when the courts develop those principles of judicial review, then of course they are mindful of the legislation and of course they are mindful of fitting tools of judicial review into the legislation and into and take account of the relationship between courts and parliament that undermine, underlies our constitutional democracy. So it doesn't mean ignoring the legislation at all. At the same time, what it does mean is that it's perfectly legitimate in public law for the courts to develop those principles in exactly the same way that it's perfectly legitimate for the courts at common law to develop principles of contract, tort, restitution and trusts, which are also read into legislation. And the consequence there, in those other areas, is exactly the same as in public law. If the court develops a principle of tortious liability or contractual liability and Parliament doesn't like it either generally or in relation to that particular piece of legislation, then it's entirely open to Parliament to amend or repeal or overturn the particular doctrine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those two uh, expert summaries of some very complex arguments. Uh, we're short of time, so I'm not going to say very much, but I'll just say a few things um, to justify my being here. Um, <laughs> Christopher says, um, looking in my direction, well, Dicey told us that we have absolute parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament can make and unmake any law. Well, that's true, but Dicey said many other things as well, and one of the things Dicey said, often forgotten, is that when the courts come to interpret statutes, decide what they mean, very often the result is not to the liking of some of the MPs who voted for the particular bill in the first place. In other words, one question is who is the final authority from legislature, the other question is, what does the legislation mean? And the courts have 
the final authority on what a statute means and how it applies to a particular case. That's why I also think this idea that you know, Parliament has the last word uh, is a bit implausible because when it comes to a controversy, the last word in a particular case is the court's word. And the court has to interpret the statute in the light of constitutional principle. So my own feeling is, is that maybe the gulf between these two positions we've heard tonight is not really quite as wide as it often seems at first sight. I tend to think talk of legislative intent here uh, itself is rather unhelpful or misleading because it suggests that when we talk about legislative intent, we're looking for some empirical, historical intention that somebody may have held that we could uh, discover if we, we look hard enough, we look perhaps hard enough in Hansard or wherever. But that's a mistake, I think, because construing statutes is very complicated, as we know, and we have to try and set the statute in its constitutional context. And nobody thinks the courts are not entitled to have regard to settle a constitutional principle. Of course, they have to try and make sense of the purpose of the statute, but then that's often qualified by considerations of principle. In fact, I see the legislative intent is the product of our interpretation. Once we've, once we've interpreted the statute, then we can work out what we attribute, what intent we attribute to the statute. It's the end of our deliberations, I think, not, not some historical fact that we have to begin, that we have to find to begin them. So it, it's an interpretive construct, I think. And again, the, the idea that the original, as opposed to the modified ultraviaries, theory was that Parliament had to have some special intention. Did each MP have to have an intention that particular kinds of controls in judicial review should be applied in relation to each particular statute? Well, I don't think Professor Wade, who uh, was the, the main defender of ultraviaries in his book, ever thought like that. Wade never, never, I think, thought that there had to be some specific intention of that kind. So, he must have had in mind something like what we now call the modified theory all along. So I wonder whether, this I'm sure will adhere me to my two friends here, but I wonder whether we couldn't simply reconcile these two positions if we tried hard enough. Why shouldn't we say that the ultraviaries doctrine is really very useful at a technical doctrinal level? Because in cases like Annis Minnick, it enables us to explain really quite clearly, I think, why the Aster Clause is not taken at face value, too literally. We know that um, we have to interpret the Aster Clause in the context of the, the whole statute. And uh, we can say that a decision made completely outside the power gr ever granted by the statute to the public body is, of course, invalid. A, a merely purported determination is no determination at all. The powers were never granted to do certain things, and therefore we can see that an Aster Clause can't be referring to that kind of decision. So we, we can invoke the Ultraviaries doctrine. And again, it helps us to explain, I think, you know, why we normally think that Ultraviaries decisions or invalid decisions are void. There was never power in the first place to make that kind of decision. So it's helpful at the doctrinal level. But we can also see, I think, from cases like Annas Minnick, that it's the common law doing most of the important work here because it's the common law that decides how we should interpret statutes and what kind of weight we should give to Aster Clauses, how we should deal with them, uh, how we should make sense of the Aster Clause without denying the, the point and purpose of the statute and granting appropriate leeway to the, the public body. So the, the common law and statute surely are working in harmony here. I can't quite see why we shouldn't accept the ultraviaries doctrine at the doctrinal level, but say that uh, it's underpinned by common law principle. It's the common law constitution that does all the, the fundamental work. And it's the common law constitution that tries to reconcile parliamentary sovereignty 
and the rule of law, the rule of law including, I think, all these fundamental common law principles. And the idea that we could have um, a constitution, an administrative law that didn't apply, some of these basic ideas about uh, relevant considerations, proper purposes, and so forth, principles of natural justice. I mean, these really are fundamental to the rule of law in the sense that they're basic to our idea of law. There must be limits to the extent to which Parliament could do away with such principles um, because if we really took absolute parliamentary sovereignty literally, it would enable Parliament to defeat the rule of law and that would undermine our very idea of law. We wouldn't really have an administrative law at all. So it's always a question of balancing these fundamental principles. Uh, and one could perhaps see the ultra-various doctrine and the common law theory as simply illustrating aspects of this attempt to achieve harmony between parliamentary sovereignty on the one hand and the rule of law on the other. Now, I will allow uh, the, speak, the two speakers to, to respond to me if they wish, but they might prefer... Uh, for me to ask the questions from the floor, since we're quite short of time. Um, do either of you want to respond to what I've just said, or would you? <laughs> well, I would like just to say that I'd like to get on to questions. I'd like the audience to have an opportunity to ask questions. But I do want one thing to say. I wrote a whole article many years ago called Heat and Light, an attempt at reconciliation, and it was completely ignored. <laughs> so I welcome your attempt and I hope it isn't ignored so the way mine was Paul, do you, uh, are you so, uh, so uh, I, I too uh, no, just, just very briefly um, uh, I too want people to be able to ask questions the only, I only want to make one comment which is that in the way that you put it I think it reveals a duality about the use of the term ultra-virus, which is actually dangerous and unhelpful because it's being used in two different ways. Look, <coughs> which, is why I, which is why I tend to refer to a legislative intent model versus a common law model. Let's be clear, and Patrick Elias, the Court of the Field Judge, pointed this out very clearly like 15 years ago and then reiterated and I reiterated it. And, uh, people weren't listening. Uh, in any event, look, the common law model, of course, accepts that there are boundaries to power. So the idea that there are some things which are intra -varies and some things which are ultra -varies is not something which the common law model ignores or fails to accept. Of course not. Of course we accept that. The key difference between, it, between the two schools of thought is not whether there are boundaries to power and things which are outside power, which is why I think the actual anismic argument in favour of the ultra model is actually, with respect to rather bizarre one, and actually doesn't work analytically. But just to stick to the po point at hand, look, in anismic, of course, uh, or in any case like anismic, the common lawyers think, of course, there are boundaries to what you can do and what you can't do. The key difference between the two schools of thought is whether you think or whether someone thinks that the nature of those boundaries can be and must be delineated through some invocation of legislative intent or whether those boundaries ultimately can and can, uh, should be set by and through the instrumentality of the principles which make up the community. My only point was that I think Legislative intent itself in this debate is quite misleading. I, 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 I agree. It's I think it's actually, you know, it's it's probably if it means anything at all, it, it's a construct uh, which incorporates common law principle. It's not something that's outside and beyond it. So maybe the whole debate is premised on a false understanding of legislative intent. But let's let's see if there are questions from our yeah. audience. I'm sure there are. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, to both Professor Craig and Professor Forsyth, how do you respond to comments um, from the Supreme Court 
um, saying that if Parliament were to attempt to abolish judicial review entirely, that they wouldn't listen to it. So, according to mind, particularly Lord Stain and Jackson, for example, because it seems like only Professor Allen would be able to accommodate such such a thing if it were to happen. Well, I think those those statements are mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's, it's, it's not a question of what one would like the Constitution to be. It's what the Constitution is. And if Parliament can make or unmake any law at all, it can make a law removing judicial review. I, as a great supporter of judicial review, would never be in favour of a law of that kind. But if Parliament were to make such a law, it would be valid and effective. Um, OK, so... I disagree. <laughs> I disagree with that. Okay, uh, and on this I'm firmly in Trevor's camp. Um, okay, but why? So just just to show that there's actually uh, that there really isn't any tension between me saying that I'm in Trevor's camp with this and anything I said about about the common law model. So just to explain, so I find it easier to talk to anyone. Um, uh, just to explain in this respect. The common law model is predicated on the assumption that there's nothing inherent in the common law model which involves a strong challenge to parliamentary sovereignty in the way that we've been talking about. Okay? However, I also think that there can be... The example you posited from Jackson and Stain is an example of a situation where there would be a strong challenge to sovereignty. There would be a strong challenge to sovereignty at stake. So if you have Parliament clearly and unequivocally passing a piece of legislation which abolished the entirety of judicial review, there would be a strong challenge to sovereignty. If the courts refused to apply that legislation, there would be a strong challenge to sovereignty. And I accept that. Okay? Now, my view about that and the reason I disagree with Christopher in terms of constitutional orthodoxy is that if you have that situation, then what you have if you want to think about it in those terms, if you want to think about it in those terms, you have a situation where your ultimate legal principle, your rule of recognition, is up for grabs. Think about it in this way. We work on the assumption that Parliament can do anything it likes by simple majority, substantively or procedurally, and procedurally. Okay? And then someone comes along and drops a nuclear bomb on this through the example of trying to do away with judicial review. And then the players in the game, including courts, but not only courts, but including courts, have to work out how they're going to react. Now, in that scenario, if the courts, as I would hope they would, refuse to apply that particular statute, okay, then the ball would be bounced back to Parliament and Parliament would see how it reacted. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that Parliament backs off, that the courts exercise a lot of muscle and the Parliament thinks it's not worth a candle. And let's assume that that becomes hardened into the underlying social practice which underlies your rule of recognition or ultimate legal principle. Then it seems to me that your ultimate legal principle would have been refashioned to say Parliament can do anything it likes by simple majority, substantively or procedurally, except that it can't do certain extreme things like abolishing the entirety of judicial review. I find nothing odd about that at all. What is odd is to imagine that our orthodoxy or apparent orthodoxy about the ultimate legal principle is somehow static. It's not. That's simply implausible normatively, and it's implausible viewed historically. The content of that top principle has altered over time. What you're positing is a scenario, an example, where it might shift again. It might not. The court might lose that tussle, in which case the status quo would remain as it was before. I, I'm not sure that the question was directed at me, but I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't resist just a brief comment. I mean, I, I'm allergic to talk of the rule of recognition because I don't believe in it. And I don't believe there's one top rule that somehow might give way if there's a power fight. All the time, courts are giving an interpretation to statutes, including ouster clauses, that 
try to find the harmony between the statutory objective and what they think is a reasonable legal response to it. And uh, courts don't ever say, well, we're just not going to accept that, that goes too far. I know they said they might in Jackson, but what, what they say is, well, this, uh, this says there can, be not, there can be no judicial review, but then Parliament never contemplated this particular situation that's arisen. And they couldn't possibly have meant there wouldn't be judicial review in this case because that would deny, as, as law says, John Law says in the Card case, Parliamentary sovereignty entails judicial power simply to decide what the statute meant and see that it's enforced. So I, I would say, you know, that the, the, the scope for change and development is already here. You know, we see it from case to case that there's this constant tension between parliamentary and judicial power, I think, uh, already with us. So I wouldn't regard uh, an extreme ouster as being really very different from a more modest ouster which the courts are really, really quite good at dealing with. But that's just my gloss. Uh, can we have another question? Who, who else would like to Which come in? Here? Sorry. I'm... Um, yeah, please. Um, this is just about the two species of legislative intent which uh, Professor Craig uh, distinguished. Um, with specific legislative intent, it's very easy to say when Parliament theoretically formed the intention, because it would have formed the intention on passing the statute concerned. But with general legislative intent, which I think was uh, explained as intending legislation to conform to basic principles of fairness and justice operating in the constitutional democracy, does it not follow that that intention must always have been held by Parliament? Uh, or if not, is there a particular point in time at which that intention was formulated? Um, my problem is, 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 is perhaps with looking back at Parliaments of earlier centuries and attributing to them all that stuff about constitutional democracy and so on. Um, okay. uh, thank you very much. Um, for the incisive question. I mean, no, I'm not sure that it's more... Uh, not sure. Well, anyway, um, you directed it at me, so I'll have not, a shot. Not it. necessarily. I mean, I, I, I did use you as the no, person no, 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 that's fine. Um, yes. Okay, so the dis just to be clear, the distinction is drawn with it by the ultra-virus theorists themselves, and it was Mark Elliott who made the transition in particular in his notable work between the specific model of legislative intent and the more general model of intent. And it then has passed into the kind of lexicon within this area and it's part of the debate, and that's absolutely fine. In relation to the uh, specific direction of your question, I think you are right, clearly, in the sense that if the content of a general model of legislative intent must itself be historically dynamic and not static because it does not withstand scrutiny otherwise. In other words, what a parliament in the 17th century would have regarded as constitutionally axiomatic is not the same thing as what a parliament in the 19th or the 21st century would have regarded as constitutionally axiomatic. And I think that's absolutely right and that would have to be regarded uh, as built into the model of general legislative intent. Though that would not undermine it in that that would not, I, know, I don't regard that as particularly problematic in itself. I mean, it's something that one would have to take into account, and rightly so. But one could still then say, in the 21st century, in the here and now, we can, we can work on the assumption that Parliament generally intends question mark empirically at the moment, but we can work on the assumption that Parliament generally intends certain precepts of rights and good administrative behaviour, etc. But yes, it's definitely historically dynamic. Has to be. Christopher, do you want to no, I'll add a comment. Another question. Uh, are there any other uh, questions you all would like to ask? If, if not, I'm going to... Yes, sorry for that. Surely the ultra... So this is too early. Surely 
some extent, it's a, a myth of a sterile debate because when we talk about the rules of judicial review, no one can deny that they uh, have developed in the common law uh, because we say that they also apply to uh, non statutory powers, so uh, prerogative powers. Uh, but surely, in the context of statutory powers, it just makes so much more sense to think about the intention of part four. So I would say general intent. And to use an ultra-varied model, just in the same way as when we look at a contract and we try to ascertain what obligations have arisen under the contract, we think about uh, the intentions of the parties drawing reference to the body of background contractual rules elucidated in the cases, it makes more sense when trying to ascertain what power has been conferred on the body mentioned in the statute to frame it in terms of the uh, what was intended, what power was intended by Parliament, and then with reference to the rules of judicial review which have developed in the common law. Does it just not make more analytical sense to use this model? I think there's not really much between them. It's just a case of what is more helpful and what is more clear. Or do, do you want to um, to that? Okay, so uh, with respect, I'm not sure in what sense it is more helpful. I mean, look, no one is doubting the key issue here, and I don't think we should take our eye off the ball, the key issue here is, um, as you yourself accepted, it's pretty much everyone accepts that it's undeniable that the courts are actually the creators of these principles. Um, and they've been doing it hand over fist for 400 years or more. So, the argument then is, I mean, because I am actually, and the older I get, the simpler I get, and the more straightforward I get, um, uh, the argument is, assuming that that is so, why should we not accept what is so as being so? All right? Given, in other, in other words, that the courts have, of their own volition, created these principles, what must there be? You, there's got to be some reason to say, oh, well... They created them, but we've got to cloak them with some intent nonetheless. Now, we had a reason given to us by the Ultravirus School, which was that you had to do that to stop, stop there being a strong challenge to sovereignty. I don't believe that analytical argument works. So if you so either you think I'm wrong, in which case that's fine, in which case you rebut my rebuttal of the analytical argument. Or you come up with some other reason why it's regarded as better to or preferable in some way to invest what is going on or to cloak it with legislative intent. Now, um, I listened carefully to the way you put the question, but at the moment I'm still searching for what that rationale is. And remember, that rationale has to be a rationale which says we've got to do it in public law, but we don't do it in tort, and we don't do it in contract when contractual and tortious principles are read into statutes as they are every single day of the week. So I, I would, sorry, can I just respond? I would say with statutory duty, uh, the power conferred is determined by that is a statutory, sorry, that is a statutory power. Uh, whereas in tort, the obligations that arise arise out of the conduct of the party. And in contract, the obligations that arise arise out of the agreement made between the party. No, but that's not uh, that that's a nice point, but it's not it's, it's not what's going on. That's that's just as it were doing an end run around the question. The question is. You've got a statute which is enacted, okay? It's a sale of goods act, it's a higher purchase act, it's anything you like. Um, it's uh, a statute 
which is about landlord and tenant, anything. And the tortious rules or the relevant contractual rules will be read into that statute to determine the respective liabilities of landlord to tenant or the respective ways in which a contract will be made by the parties subject to anything being specified in the statute to the contrary. Now, the logic, if you buy into the logic of the ultra-virus model, and particularly if you buy into the analytical argument, you cannot do that. You cannot read those principles in because unless Parliament, Parliament either intended the rule on contract formation to exist and be read into the statute, or it didn't. And if you can't find the legislative intent to suggest that those rules on contract formation should be read into the statute, then it's illegitimate to read them in, in which case you've got to invest the reading in of those common law principles derived from private law with the same legislative intent as they're doing for public law. Now, as I said, nobody thinks that. You talk to private lawyers, and actually private lawyers, and I've talked to private lawyers in some detail about this, and private lawyers just reason in the same way, because they're not uh, about this, as I specified in relation to the third part of the analysis, we're looking at sovereignty and the meaning of sovereignty. They just say, look, there's the common law. Those principles are read in. If Parliament doesn't like them for some reason, it says so, and it um, specifies that the rule should not be applicable in this context. Otherwise, the default position is that the principles are applicable. No need to find legislative intent in the circumstances. Can I yes, I'd like to say something on this, this subject. First of all, I agree with the comment. I think it makes a good point. Secondly, several times this evening, Professor Craig has raised the, article, uh, the, the argument that the modified ultra-virus doctrine, if adopted, means that the law of contract becomes a question of implied legislative intention. I think this is quite wrong. And what it overlooks is the nature of public law. Constitutions are about the allocation of power. Are the judges to decide this issue or is it to be decided by politicians? Is this to be decided by the county council or is it to be decided by the district council? Constitution law is essentially about the allocation of, allocation of power. And so when one's talking about the modified ultra-virus doctrine, when he's talking about it in the context of an allocation of power, and that is where one determines implied limits on the power allocated. And that's the difference between public law and the law of contract and the law of tort and so forth. And it was good to hear you making it, hearing that argument emerging from the body of the hall. Thank you very much. Could I just give one very quick rejoinder to that? Just to make it clear, I am not saying in any shape, manner or form, I'm not saying there's no differences between public law and private law, I'm not saying that at all. Um, that would be ridiculous. What I'm saying, and I'm not denying that constitutional law is about the allocation of power, I'm not saying that at all. Of course that's, uh, that's, that is true. What I'm saying is Parliament is equally sovereign when it enacts a sale of good piece of legislation as when it an, or an occupier's liability statute or landlord and tenant statute as when it enacts a regulatory piece of legislation dealing with equality or one of the other regulatory issues which form part of public law. The Parliament is not a different body. It is the same sovereign body. <clears throat> so, if you believe my argument is a very simple one and is not, with respect, I think, met by, the, by your rejoinder, if you believe that Parliament must give, must have, give its advanced consent to the statutory monopoly model, as I mentioned it, if you believe that it 
Parliament must give its consent in advance to any precept before it's legitimate to read that precept into legislation, then, and that is the argument, then that same uh, point must be applicable to all legislation. There is, in that sense, no difference. It's the same sovereign body in all contexts. Do you, I mean, do you think, Paul, that ultraviaries could be used as a shorthand way of saying what you've just said? I mean, it's, it could be understood as a response to the argument, well, the courts imposing these controls in this particular case is somehow contrary to Parliament's will because it fetters the discretion, the freedom to decide of the public body. And the response is, no, it doesn't because this is the right way to interpret the Act. The common law controls are not inconsistent with the duty imposed on the public body. Uh, when the public body acts in this way, it's acting, uh, therefore, inconsistently with its power, and in that sense, contrary to Parliament's instructions. So it's a sort of complex way of saying that there is, in fact, no, no threat to, to Parliament. Um, well, well, I could answer that. So in that way, ultra-rise will be used as a sort of summary of what you just said about why common law control is not, in fact, a challenge to parliamentary sovereignty. Well, that's the whole point of the modified ultra-virus doctrine, to enable common law principles to it apply without challenging the supremacy of... But, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, deny that the common law principles are, are doing all the fundamental work. But it doesn't deny that at all. It never has. I mean, the, the, the principles well, of the interpretation... I brought you both together. <laughs> the, the principles of the interpretation of statutes common. Are, common, <laughs> are common law principles. Well, maybe we've reached a little bit of agreement at the end, I hope so. But uh, I think it's time we, we, we have gone well beyond our, our uh, original time. So I'd like to just end by saying a great thank you to our two main speakers tonight particularly to Professor Craig, who's come all the way from Oxford tonight to give this talk. So thank you very much to him and to him.